Hello, friends and cohorts. Well, it looks like it's going to be another fine day. You know, have you ever wondered what would happen if Middle Earth was invaded by aliens? Well, now you don't have to. And by now, I mean if you travel back to 1983 to watch Kroll. Planet of Kroll is under attack by aliens, led by the uh, fearsome tyrant, the Beast. Very original name, I know. To stop him, a marriage has been arranged between two medieval kingdoms to forge an alliance to force the invaders off-world, presumably by throwing filthy peasants at the problem until the invaders catch the plague. Coincidentally, the Beast literally came to Kroll just to get hitched. Turns out the Beast is a family man. He just wants to teach his unborn son how to enslave worlds. The Beast invades, the wedding is crashed, the princess is taken, and her boyfriend has to go get her back. Very standard stuff, but I enjoy the Arthurian simplicity of it. So before I begin showering this movie with praise, the acting reaffirms Pinocchio's ambitions, the art direction has the consistency of beanie weenies with chunks of cactus in, like I'm allowed to talk, the special effects are as eclectic in quality as a bag of candy from kindly old Mr. Goering, and perhaps the most egregious crime of all, there are not enough scenes with Liam Neeson. Now, on to the good bits. The Beast is a great villain. He is portrayed as intelligent and powerful from start to end of the film. If he was your neighbor, he'd be so evil. He would be the kind of neighbor that gives you store-bought fruitcake each Christmas, and during Halloween has only unwrapped jawbreakers. He is pure malevolence. At one point in the story, an elderly seer is asked to find the location of the Black Fortress, but the Beast knows he's being spied on. So he does the obvious thing, and he literally reaches through time and space to crush the seeing crystal with his own bare hands. So, yeah, the Beast is pretty high up on my list of villains. He also possesses a host of terrors called Slayers. Slayers are the kind of sci-fi concept we don't get anymore. They can walk underwater, scale smooth walls, and if you destroy them, the parasitic worm that pilots the armor bursts from the head and escapes into the dirt. One disappointment in the movie is the signature weapon of the protagonist, the glaive. It is a flying telekinetic buzzsaw, but for some reason, this highly useful tool only started being used at the climax of the movie, and in the end, it can't even defeat the beast. But the power of love does. By the way, the power of love manifests as a flamethrower, the more you know. But it's difficult to hold a grudge for that when there are so many amazing things in this movie. For instance, a crystal spider bound to a woman with the power of prophecy. A scene of a manatee assassin confessing her love for the prince and betraying her spacefaring overlord. A cyclops burdened with the knowledge of his own death, but defies it in spite of the agony it causes him. Regardless of how terrible the movie actually is, a film that contains all these things has the kind of value to the human race that warrants federal protection from critics. Also, to my knowledge, this is the only movie where you can see a young Liam Neeson wielding a battle axe while on a flying horse that trails fire. Uh -oh. 